The White Shirts, written by Endeavor, illustrated by Gifts Ungiven. Roger grunted in pain. He looked up at himself in the bathroom mirror and said through clenched teeth, and I thought Mondays sucked before this became part of the routine. He let out another huge grunt, lasting about two seconds, followed by a sigh of relief as he dropped his head down into the empty bathroom sink. In the kitchen, he opened the GNN news application on his smart device while drinking his morning coffee before heading off to work. Dr. Crunchy, what would you say is the best way to stay vigilant in fending off the Divoc 91 stomach flu, said the female anchor in the video on his smart device. Well, as of right now, we encourage people to continue to limit their meat consumption to two portions a week maximum, along with the weekly administration of the anti-Divoc suppository. But limiting yourself to one portion of meat a week or none at all remains the safer option, Dr. Crunchy replied. What would you say to those who are under the impression that they don't need to take their weekly suppository, that they can skip a week or two, or those who think that taking the suppository enables them to consume more than the limit of two portions of meat a week being recommended by health professionals, the anchor asked. I'd say that they're being extremely selfish, Dr. Crunchy answered. If people aren't following the health guidelines, our hospitals will be overrun and we won't be able to provide the necessary medical care to those who need it. Roger checked the time. Realizing he had to leave for work soon, he quickly finished his coffee and threw on his t-shirt. His t-shirt was grey with a green shield on it and a caption which read, Divoc Protected. Getting on the bus, as he made his way to an available seat, Roger noticed that while almost everyone on the bus was wearing the same Divoc Protected t-shirt, a few people, maybe three or four, were wearing purple shirts. Once he had sat down, Roger checked his smart device again. Opening the GlueTube application, he immediately saw the thumbnail of a video featuring an African woman struggling with a jug of water she was carrying on her head. Roger saw that the video had been posted the day before, but it had already reached 10 million hits. He opened the video. It started with nondescript emotional xylophone music and video footage of the Earth from outer space. After about three seconds, a high-pitched, slightly effeminate male narrator voice began. Our planet is facing a global catastrophe, one that threatens the very nature of life itself. Each year, each day, as the population expands and human activity increases, we come closer and closer to the devastating consequences of gravity change. After some statistics and jargon about the number of people on the planet and trends over the past few decades, accompanied by images of people walking on crowded metropolitan streets, the narrator went on to explain the cause of this threat. You might not know it, but you contribute to gravity change every day. Each step you take creates a small amount of pressure pushed down upon the Earth's surface. Insignificant, you might think. But the collective energy being exerted upon the Earth from the movement of an increasing human population is more than it can handle. The video then cut to footage of children in Africa at a well scooping water into jerry cans. Populations of developed countries are the biggest contributors to gravity change, but its effects are felt the worst in the developing world. The average weight of citizens of developed countries is higher as a result of greater access to nourishment. Thus, their steps place significantly greater pressure upon the planet. In the developing world, many people need to walk 5 kilometers a day just to get access to water a trip that's often made on an empty stomach. The increase in gravity caused by the collective stomping of humans will make this trip almost impossible for many poor and impoverished people. Following some footage of smiling African children and landscapes of blue skies and green fields, the video concluded with the narrator saying, This global problem will require a global solution. So what can be done? Some activists have already decided to act. By limiting one's steps to 5,000 per day, the effects of gravity change can be significantly reduced. If enough people decide to make this sacrifice for the good of the planet, you might not know it, but you have the power to make a difference, no matter how small. We've started the Pledge 5000 campaign. We want to get at least 5,000 people in every major metropolitan area to pledge to limit their steps to only 5,000 per day. This won't be the end of the threat of gravity change, but it will be the beginning of a solution to this global crisis.
The video ended with an animation of a purple ribbon with the hashtag Pledge5000 underneath it. Looking up from his phone, Roger saw that the bus was nearing his stop. He got off and entered his office building. Upon arriving at the morning staff meeting, he saw that everyone was wearing a Divock-protected gray t-shirt, except for Rachel, one of his co-workers. She was wearing a purple t-shirt. Miss Chow entered the meeting hall wearing a purple shirt and loudly said, Okay, we're going to be starting in a few moments. Please make your way to your seats. The projector turned on and the presentation started. Miss Chow began. I'm very happy with how our company's initiative to fight the Divox stomach flu went. Today, I'm pleased to announce our next corporate social responsibility campaign. Roger sighed, knowing that Rachel was ahead of the curve on this one and that she would be moving to the front of the line for the upcoming promotion. Miss Chow continued, We all know the global threat posed by gravity change, and we feel it's our responsibility as a company to do our part. Our leadership has committed to the Pledge 5000 campaign to only take a massive maximum of 5,000 steps per day. We are encouraging all our employees to take part as well. I see that Rachel has taken the initiative and made the pledge already. She is someone you should all look to as an example of an employee dedicated to our company's values. That evening, Roger purchased several purple t-shirts on his way home. When back home, he was contemplating whether or not he should go for his evening jog. On the one hand, no one at work would know that he did, but on the other, if he was going to chase the promotion, he should be committed to doing what it takes. Commitment is doing your best even when no one else is watching, right? He decided against going for his evening run and to stay in and see what new episodes had been uploaded to his streaming surface. On Tuesday, he wore a purple shirt to work, as did all of his colleagues, as they sat through another morning seminar on the importance of the fight against gravity change. That evening, after finishing work, he visited his parents' house for dinner, along with his sister Madison. We're all doing the Pledge 5000 campaign at work, but I mean, that really should just be a given, Madison smugly explained to their folks. I feel like if we're really committed to making a difference, we need to go a step further. I'm gonna limit myself to only 4,000 steps a day. Gravity change is a real fucking issue, and we need to get our shit together, like, now. That's great, Madison, their mother exclaimed. If you keep this up, you'll be on your way to promotion in no time, their father added. And what about you, Roger? asked his mother. Well, I think I'll cut down on my evening jogs, maybe two times a week instead of three or four, Roger replied. Um, that's all you can be asked to do to save the planet? You know, people a lot less fortunate than you are the primary victims of gravity change. Did you ever consider thinking of someone other than yourself? Snapped Madison. Um, I said I would... You... Roger tried to get something out in reply before he was interrupted by his mother. Now, now, Madison. Roger said he would make sacrifices in his own way. He's doing his part too, his mother said, trying to avoid a spat between her son and her daughter. It's good that you are, son, his father said. It'll help you out at work. By the way, did you show your support early? I wore a purple shirt today, but my co-worker Rachel got a head start on Monday, Roger answered. His father sighed. Well, it's good that you're working your way back. On Wednesday evening, now three days into his involuntary commitment to Pledge 5000, Roger sat at home, feeling rather sloth-like not having his regular weekly exercise. He contemplated breaking his begrudgingly self-imposed 5,000 steps a day limit. He really wanted the promotion at work, but then again, no one would know if he broke the pledge. After about 20 minutes of a back and forth with himself, he decided to throw on his running shoes and tracksuit with his purple t-shirt over top and go out for a jog. While descending the stairs of his apartment, he passed a middle-aged woman wearing a purple t-shirt carrying a bag of cat food and a wine bottle. Roger didn't even make eye contact with her. He was halfway down the next flight of stairs when he heard a voice say, Where do you think you're going? He looked up the half flight of stairs to see the woman glaring at him with a frown on her face. I beg your pardon? Roger replied. I saw you outside earlier this evening when I was at the liquor store. You've passed your limit of steps for the day, don't you think? The woman said with malice in her voice. I think that's really none of your business, answered Roger. Well, gravity change affects the entire planet, Buster, so it really is my business, she said. 
Roger looked at her for another second or two before he turned and continued to quickly descend the stairs. She shouted something, but he couldn't hear it over the sound of his feet banging against the stairs. Thursday and Friday of that week passed without incident. No one at work knew he wasn't sticking to the pledge, so he didn't lose any prestige on account of that. But it was clear that Rachel was still the front runner for the upcoming promotion, seeing as she got a head start on Monday when she was the first one to come in wearing purple. On the weekend, Roger checked to make sure that the cat lady wasn't in the stairwell before going out for his evening run. On Sunday night, Roger went to bed around 11.30pm but awoke in the early hours of Monday morning, around 2am. After trying to get back to sleep for about half an hour, he gave up and checked his smart device. He had a notification from his GNN news app which read, Breaking News. He opened the app to find a huge banner at the top of the screen which read, War. Slavia invades Kryun in the early hours of Monday morning. Clicking on the banner, he was taken to a live broadcast of the news network. A female anchor said, We are reporting to you live and the situation is developing, but we can confirm that, as of just under two hours ago, Slavia has launched an invasion of its smaller neighbor, the Republic of Kryun. Explosions were heard just before 6am local time, that being midnight our time. Since then, fighter jets have been seen flying over border regions, and there have even been reports of skirmishes between the defense forces of Cryune and invading troops. Roger spent the next hour or so in the dark of his room lit up only by the light given off from his smart device, scanning through the videos and news reports of this sudden war until he began to feel his eyes getting sore from staring at the screen. Just after 3.30am, he decided to try to get some more sleep. He fell asleep about 20 minutes later. He woke up at 7 a.m., still tired from his insufficient amount of sleep from the night before. While drinking his morning coffee, he opened GluTube on his device to see that a short three-minute video had been posted titled, War, Cryune's Struggle for Freedom. He clicked on the video. It began with aerial footage of a European city accompanied by poignant music played by a string orchestra. A few seconds in, a female narrator began to speak. This is Cryune, a country with a bloody history, which has just gotten even bloodier. The video then cut to black and white war footage of tanks rolling and soldiers firing. Today, Cryune faces the worst catastrophe they have as a country since the Fascis invaded in the Second Global War. In the decades that followed that conflict, the struggle for freedom and democracy in Cryune has continued, but it still hasn't been won. The footage then changed to children sitting in a classroom, then to a close-up of a woman holding an infant, followed by footage of crowds of protesters holding signs. The narrator continued, Today, Cryuna is a diverse country, whose people are committed to their pursuit of democracy and human rights. In recent years, they've made great strides towards attaining equal rights for women and the LGBTP community. But not everyone is happy about this. Slavia, whose empire Cryune once belonged to, has pushed back on Cryune's progress towards freedom and independence for years. The video cut to footage of Slavia's president behind a desk giving a speech, though the audio was not included. The narrator then said, Their former rulers have now gone all the way and invaded. The video then cut to footage of helicopters flying and missiles exploding. As Cryunians fight for freedom and democracy with their blood, what can you do to help? The White Dove campaign, named after the bird which symbolizes love, peace, and freedom, is raising money to fund the Cryunian struggle and humanitarian efforts in the region. You can find out how to donate from the links below as your small way of supporting the cause of democracy throughout the world. Roger then went to his wardrobe to get dressed for the day. He grabbed his purple Gravity Change t-shirt, but then paused for a moment. He opened the GluTube app on his phone again and saw that the video which he had just watched at breakfast had already exceeded 5 million views within less than 4 hours of being posted. He thought to himself, if I'm going to catch up in the promotion sweepstakes at work, I need to start taking some risks. He then returned the purple t-shirt to his wardrobe and pulled out a white t-shirt. He put it on and set off for work. On the bus, most people were wearing purple shirts, but he was slightly reassured when he saw two others wearing white shirts. Upon arriving at the office, he felt slightly less confident walking into the staff meeting room to see that the entire staff were still wearing purple shirts. 
He was the only one in the room wearing a white shirt. Roger exchanged a hostile glance with Rachel on the way to his seat. It's all or nothing, he thought to himself as he anxiously awaited Miss Chow's arrival. When the door opened, Roger felt his stomach drop in anticipation, followed by a sudden and overwhelming feeling of joy and relief. Miss Chow was wearing a white t-shirt. Trying to hold back a smile, he looked over at Rachel who was visibly distraught. Miss Chow began, as you may have already heard, we received some tragic news this morning. A conflict has broken out and the Cryunian people need our help. You may have heard of the tumultuous political situation in Cryun from the news. The people have been bravely fighting for openness and democracy for years, but this has led to aggression from their neighbor Slavia. Roger listened intently, knowing that this was his chance to pull ahead in the race for the promotion. Miss Chow continued, only hours ago, Cryun was invaded by Slavia. It's a humanitarian disaster and a tragedy. Throughout our company's history, we have always been committed to the promotion of democracy and human rights at home and around the world. We will work two extra hours each day and donate our excess revenue to the Cryunian cause. Miss Chow then looked over at Roger wearing his white t-shirt. I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize Roger. He has already taken the initiative and shown his commitment to the cause of peace and human rights. Please look to him as an example of a representative of the values which we hope to uphold as a company. Though the idea of working two hours a day overtime without extra pay was daunting, Roger felt energized knowing that he was now a contender for the upcoming promotion. That evening, arriving home later than usual, yet still feeling invigorated, Roger decided to go for a run. While descending the staircase of his building, he was stopped yet again by the same middle-aged cat lady, who was still wearing a purple t-shirt, though had a shopping bag full of white ones. Where do you think you're going? Haven't you heard of gravity? I'm going to raise money for Cryune. What have you done for democracy and human rights today? Roger interrupted. Well, why, I have... But, um, the woman stuttered. Roger walked past her before she could even answer and enjoyed his evening run. On Tuesday, after another productive, albeit long, day of work, Roger again went to his parents' house for dinner along with his sister Madison, though he arrived later than usual. Each employee at our company is going to devote at least half an hour a day to raising money and awareness for the Cryunian struggle, Madison said. But I feel that, you know, human rights means so much more to me than that. So today, I decided to do more outreach after work. I spent a full hour today. That's wonderful, Madison, their mother said gleefully. What about you, Roger? Are you doing a campaign at work too? Yes, in fact, I was the first one at the office to show my support for the White Dove campaign. I even got a head start on Rachel. We're going to do an extra two hours a day and donate the additional funds to the Cryunian cause, Roger said. But today, I arrived at work half an hour early so I could contribute even more. Wow, Roger! That's fantastic! His mother exclaimed. Roger, you're really working your way up. At this rate, that promotion will be yours, his father added. Roger looked over at Madison, who was glaring at him in jealousy, for once being upended. Roger worked tirelessly that week. On Friday, after their morning staff meeting, Miss Chow pulled him aside. She said to him, Roger, I must say that I'm impressed by your devotion to our company's values. Keep this up and you'll have a bright future with us. That weekend, Roger was wondering what he could do to pull even further ahead from his competition. The promotion was almost his. He just needed to do something to push himself across the finish line. He decided to go out and do street activism, raising funds for the Cryunian cause which he would put towards his company's participation in the White Dove campaign. On Saturday, he spent three hours on a busy street corner handing out flyers with information on the conflict in Cryun and how the reader could support the campaign for human rights. He struck up discussions with interested passerbys on the importance of human rights and asked if they would like to donate. On Sunday, he spent eight hours on the street doing the same. He came home past midnight on Sunday night and collapsed in bed from exhaustion. Waking up on Monday morning, he checked his smart device and felt his heart stop. He had overslept and he was going to be late for work. Roger quickly jumped up, threw on his white t-shirt, quickly brushed his hair and teeth and bolted out the door, not even taking the time to drink his morning coffee. Last week had gone 
swimmingly, and he feared losing his lead, which he had built up in the race for the promotion. He thought to himself as he raced for the bus that he might just have enough time to get to the office in time for the morning staff meeting, if he was lucky. He sprinted to the bus stop, which his bus was approaching, and jumped on without a second to spare. Out of breath, he put his token in the box and turned to find a seat. After a second or two of scanning the bus for an available seat, he was overcome with an intense feeling of dread. While about half of the passengers were still wearing white t-shirts, the other half were wearing shirts with three large horizontal stripes. One red, one black, and one green. What the... Roger said to himself as he was trying to figure out what the striped shirts represented. He checked his smart device. He opened the GlueTube app to see a banner at the top of the screen which read, Nelson Luther Floyd Jr. Week 2030. He saw the first video on his feed titled, the legacy of Nelson Luther Floyd Jr., why we remember. Roger didn't even open the video. He struck his fist against his side and growled, Damn it! through clenched teeth. He then sat down at an available seat and spent the journey to work praying that his company wasn't starting a new corporate social responsibility campaign this week. Otherwise, his shot at the promotion would be gone. Arriving at work a few minutes late, he entered the staff meeting room to see that about three quarters of the employees were wearing red, black, and green t-shirts. The remainder were still wearing white t-shirts. He then looked over at Miss Chow who was about to start her presentation. To Roger's dismay, the t-shirt she was wearing was red, black, and green. Roger was devastated. All the ground he had gained in the past week had just gone up in smoke. As he made his way over to a seat, he briefly made eye contact with Rachel whose face was lit up like a Christmas tree. Roger quickly looked away. Good morning, everyone, Miss Chow began. This week marks a very special occasion for our company. As I see many of you already know, this is Nelson Luther Floyd Jr. week. Roger was grieving at the loss of his chance at promotion, not even paying attention to the presentation. Our company has always been devoted to the promotion of tolerance and inclusion and the elimination of racism and discrimination, Miss Chow continued. So for us, Nelson Luther Floyd Jr. was a visionary whose life we celebrate each year. In commemoration of his life's work in pursuit of equality and human rights, we will be hosting after-work seminars each day this week in which we will read speeches given by Dr. Floyd and discuss why they're important to us today. Pulling himself through the rest of the day was a struggle for Roger. He remained almost silent throughout the two-hour-long Nelson Luther Floyd Jr. seminar he was forced to sit through after working hours, only occasionally nodding his head in agreement when called upon. He went straight home after work. On his way up the stairs to his apartment, he passed by the same middle-aged woman holding a new bag of cat food under her arm and wearing a red, black, and green t-shirt. Don't you know what week it is? She squawked. There are people with less privilege than you who have had to fight for there. She continued, but Roger simply walked past her, not even making eye contact. As soon as he entered his door, he fell down on his bed and lied there for about two hours. He begrudgingly got off his bed and walked to his local clothes store with his head down, where he bought himself a red, black, and green t-shirt before returning home and going straight to sleep. On Tuesday morning, he stood in front of his wardrobe, staring blankly at the red, black, and green t-shirt he had reluctantly bought the evening prior. He remained in place for about 20 minutes, contemplating whether or not it was all worth it anymore. He just couldn't bring himself to put that red, black, and green t-shirt on. He looked over at his white t-shirt and put it on before leaving for work, skipping his morning coffee, having wasted so much time just standing there. Upon getting on the bus, he saw that every single passenger was wearing a red, black, and green t-shirt, except for him. As he walked down the bus's aisle looking for a seat, he could feel the stares of disapproval falling upon him from fellow passengers. He saw an empty seat near the back, but as he went to sit down, the guy sitting beside it put his bag on the seat and said, It's taken, glaring at Roger with a scowl on his face. Upon arriving at work and entering the staff meeting room, he again was the only person not wearing a t-shirt honoring Nelson Luther Floyd Jr. week. Miss Chow started her presentation saying, So, as our company commemorates the extraordinary life of Nelson Luther Floyd Jr. this week, we... She paused when her eyes fell upon Roger, notably wearing a white t-shirt. She continued after a second or two. We will be continuing our series of seminars on... Roger stopped listening. He couldn't have answered what the presentation was about if asked a second after it finished. After struggling through the day, he tried to escape unnoticed to avoid sitting through the seminar titled, Dr. Floyd's Dream, The Fight for Racial Justice Goes On. He briskly walked to the exit, glancing side to side, hoping he wouldn't be noticed. As he was just 10 meters from the door, he heard a voice say, Roger. He turned to see Miss Chow standing there. 
Our seminar is starting soon, she said. I'm not feeling well, Roger answered quickly and made his way out the door before she could reply. That evening, being Tuesday, meant that he was having dinner at his parents' house and that Madison would be there. As the family sat at the table, you could cut the tension with a knife. Madison stared at Roger unblinkingly with an intense rage in her eyes as he sat there wearing a white t-shirt. Their mother concernedly looked back and forth at her two kids. To break the deafening silence, she timidly said, So, Madison, how are you honoring Nelson Luther Floyd Jr. week at work? Madison slowly turned to face her mother and said, holding back palpable fury in her voice, I'm writing an essay on Dr. Floyd's life and how he continues to inspire the fight for equality today. The writer of the essay, which is judged to be the best, will be giving a speech to the entire company at the end of the week on the importance of remembering him and his heroism. Madison then turned to look at Roger and said, Clearly there's a lot more work to do when so many people today are totally oblivious to the oppression which those less privileged than them face. She raised her voice when uttering the last sentence as her ability to hold back her anger began to wane. Their mother nervously asked, Um, Roger, how are you celebrating Nelson Luther Floyd Jr. week at work? Roger sighed, looking down at the table and waited about two seconds before answering. I'm not. Madison dropped her fork. What? His father asked loudly. His mother then asked in a panic, Um, are you, um, you're wearing a white shirt. Is it to show your support for democracy and human rights in, um, uh, what is it? Cryoon? His father interjected. Yes, Cryoon, his mother then said. Is it in support of Cryoon? No, I... Roger paused before finishing his sentence. I just like wearing a white shirt. He then looked up from the table to see Madison on the verge of tears. But, 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 Roger, his mother said, don't you know how important Nelson Luther Floyd Jr. week is? It's a time when- I'm sorry, Mom, Roger interrupted, but I really don't care about Nelson Luther Floyd Jr. Madison let out a squeak. She then looked at her father, then her mother, then quickly got up from the table and rushed to the kitchen. Their mother looked at Roger, then at her husband with mortified eyes. As she heard her daughter sobbing in the kitchen, she got up to go comfort her. Roger, his father said, don't you want the promotion? You know this is going to kill any chance that you had. Yeah, I know, replied Roger. Son, haven't you thought about your career? About your future? Roger sighed again before he got up and said, I think I should go now. Thanks for dinner. He then left for home. On Wednesday morning, Roger spent all of three minutes rather than 20 like the day prior, contemplating whether or not he should give in and put on the red, black, and green t-shirt. He just couldn't do it, so he put on a white t-shirt again and left for work after finishing his morning coffee. He didn't even check his smart device once that morning. Upon getting on the bus, he again felt the hostility of the fellow passengers wearing their red, black, and green t-shirts. As he scanned the bus for a seat, he noticed something peculiar which caught his attention. There was another person wearing a white t-shirt a man with an unoccupied seat beside him. Roger walked over and asked, Can I sit down? Yeah, go ahead, the man answered. Roger sat down. He looked straight ahead for about five seconds before the man beside him, also wearing a white t-shirt, spoke again. You know, I saw you on the bus yesterday. You were the only one wearing a white shirt. I know this is going to sound weird, but that's what made me decide to wear one today. Roger turned to look at the guy with a confused look on his face. What? he asked. I don't know how to explain, but seeing you on the bus yesterday, he then paused, I felt I just couldn't bring myself to wear that red, black, and green shirt this morning. I decided to put on a white one instead. It certainly won't do me any favors at work, but I figured, well, what difference would it make at this point? Roger was silent, not knowing how to respond. After a brief couple of seconds, the man spoke again. My name is Mike. What's yours? Roger, he replied. Mike then asked, Say, Roger, are you doing anything this evening? Would you like to meet up later on? If you can. Roger thought for a moment. He first tried to think of an excuse not to, but then he considered all the other ways he could possibly spend his evening instead. Uh, alright, I could do that, he answered. Cool, let's meet at that street corner over there at, let's say, 6 o'clock. How does that sound? Yeah, it sounds good. Here's my contact info, Roger answered. Shortly after, the bus arrived at his stop and he got off. After sleepwalking through another day at work and undoubtedly losing even more standing with his company, Roger met Mike on the street corner which they had agreed upon. After somewhat awkwardly greeting each other, Mike suggested that they go to a nearby restaurant where they can have a drink. Roger agreed. 
Upon arriving at the restaurant, they were greeted by a waiter whose customer service veneer of friendliness was barely able to hide his discontent for the pair wearing white t-shirts. Table for two, Mike said. The waiter looked at them for a second, then at their shirts, and then back at them. Sure, right this way, the waiter said unenthusiastically. He brought them to a two-seated table in the middle of the dining room. The waiter left two menus without saying anything. So, what do you do, Roger asked. I... I work for, uh, for a company, Mike answered. Yeah, um, I, I do too, Roger said. They glanced around the restaurant to see that other diners were staring at them with nasty looks on their faces. Some were whispering to each other as they looked at Roger and Mike, the only diners not wearing red, black, and green t-shirts. After a few uncomfortable minutes of being stared at and awkward dialogue, the manager approached their table. I do apologize, but we have received complaints from customers that you are making them feel uncomfortable. I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to leave, said the manager. Mike and Roger looked at each other before Roger wearily replied, All right. They then got up and left the restaurant without an argument. As they stood on the street outside the restaurant, Mike said, Hey, I actually know another place not too far from here. Do you want to go there? They won't give us any trouble. Roger sighed and said, Sure, I guess. He couldn't imagine how giving it a try could possibly make his day any worse than it already was. They walked about two blocks until they got to the entrance of a nondescript building with a fluorescent light which simply read, Bar. This is it, Mike said. They entered. The place was empty other than a bored-looking, overweight man in his 50s sitting behind the bar wearing a red, black, and green t-shirt. He stood up and looked at them for a second, seeing that they were wearing white t-shirts, then shrugged before asking them if he could get them something to drink. I'll take a rum and coke, said Mike. All of the same, said Roger. Now in a much less hostile environment, the awkward barrier between the two was lifted and Roger and Mike found that they actually got on pretty well together. They spoke about their interests, books they've read, sports they play, but what they really bonded over was poking fun at the ridiculous corporate social responsibility campaigns their companies were conducting. As the two were laughing out loud at the idea of spending their evening in a seminar discussing Nelson Luther Floyd Jr., the bartender approached them. Say guys, what's with the white shirt? asked the bartender. We just like them, replied Roger. But isn't it Floyd Nelson week or something? The bartender asked. Mike laughed loudly and said, Who cares? The bartender paused for a second, then smiled and nodded his head before returning to the other side of the bar where he was sitting. Roger and Mike spent three hours there. When they finally decided they would leave, as the two of them departed, Mike asked, Do you want to come back here again tomorrow? Sure, Roger answered. On Thursday, after another forgettable day at work where his mind wandered throughout, Roger once again met Mike outside the same nondescript bar. Upon entering, the bartender gleefully greeted them loudly, exclaiming, Welcome back! To his surprise, Roger saw that the bartender was now wearing a white t-shirt himself. What can I get you? Same as yesterday? He asked Roger and Mike. Yeah, that'd be great, answered Roger. By the way, my name is Richard, the bartender said. Glad to see you both again. Roger and Mike got their drinks at the bar and shared their jokes with Richard, the bartender. The three of them had a great time together. Richard, for whom business had always been slow, felt himself enjoying his job for the first time in a long time. The only other people in the bar were a group of five sitting quietly at a table in the corner, all of whom wore red, black, and green shirts. Two men and three women. They sat there almost in silence as across the room, Roger, Mike, and Richard livened up the place. One of the men at the table approached them. What's with the white shirts? he asked. We just like them, Richard replied. The man smiled and asked, Can we join you? Sure, come on over, said Roger. The five sitting at the table then approached the bar and introduced themselves to Roger, Mike, and Richard. After a minute or two, the newcomers opened up and they had a great evening too. On Friday evening, Roger and Mike decided to go to the bar again, which they now referred to as Richards. The group from the previous day was there again, now wearing white t-shirts, and they brought along a few more friends. In total, the bar had around 16 people, slightly more of whom were men, but there was a fair number of women as well. Though the bar was not nearly as full as other venues, for Roger, it felt so much livelier. One of the men Roger spoke to was a middle-aged guy named Mark who owned a bowling alley. It's a family business. My wife and I own it. You guys should come by sometime, Mark said to Roger and Mike. I'm sure no one will bother you. We usually don't get too much business anyhow. Sure, that sounds good, answered Roger. On Saturday afternoon, Roger, Mike, and two other white shirts went bowling. 
On Sunday, he decided to stay home in the evening. He had spent many Sundays not doing much, but for the first time, Roger actually felt relaxed on a slow, uneventful Sunday. On Monday morning, Roger got up, drank his morning coffee, put on his white shirt, and set off for work a couple minutes later than usual, but he couldn't be bothered to rush. He was the only one wearing a white shirt on the bus, which was full of passengers wearing rainbow-striped t-shirts. He got a few nasty stares, but it didn't bother him. He stood for the journey, not bothering to find a seat. He got to the office ten minutes late. Miss Chow had already started giving her morning presentation when he arrived. And as we start, she paused and looked at Roger for a second as he entered the room. She continued, As we start LGBTP week, I'm proud to announce that your colleague Rachel has been promoted, and that she will be taking a leadership role in our corporate social responsibility campaigns going forward, starting with this week's initiative. The staff applauded, all of whom were wearing rainbow-striped t-shirts, except for Roger. As Rachel stood up, she looked at Roger with a smug look on her face, which disappeared when she saw not anger but indifference from Roger. She then looked away and continued to smile at the other employees. After the presentation, Roger was approached by Miss Chow. Roger, could I see you in my office after the staff meeting? She asked. Roger didn't say anything. He simply nodded. Please come in, Roger. Take a seat, Miss Chow said as he entered her office. Now, you know that the one thing we ask of our employees is that they show a commitment to our company's core values. This is expected of everyone who works here. Recently, we have felt that you haven't lived up to this commitment. We wanted to give you some time to turn things around, but unfortunately, we haven't seen an improvement. I'm sorry, Roger, but we're going to have to let you go. Roger was silent. Now, I know this is hard news for you to receive. We appreciate the time you spent with our company, and we want to part ways on good terms. So, it's all right, Roger interrupted. Don't worry about it. His face lightened and he stood up. Confused, Miss Chow said, Well, goodbye then. Roger left the building. It was a bright, sunny morning, so he decided to walk to the nearest park. He sat there enjoying the morning and then the afternoon. At around 1 p.m., he received a text message on his smart device. It was from his mother. He opened the message. Roger, you know your father and I love you very much, but we feel that you have not only hurt your sister, but hurt our family. Regretfully, we're going to have to ask you not to come to our home until we find it within ourselves to forgive you. Love, Mom. He spent another two hours at the park before he decided to go home and sleep for three hours. That evening, he went to Richard's. The bar was full of about 30 white shirts, with a mix of both men and women. At about 8 p.m., a group of four people walked in wearing rainbow-striped t-shirts. The entire bar went silent and nervously stared at the newcomers. The four of them then removed their rainbow shirts to reveal that they were wearing white shirts underneath. Everyone in the bar then let out a cheer before going back to their conversations. An older man came to Roger and Mike's table. Can I join you guys? Sure, they answered. How's the day been? The old man asked. Well, I lost my job today, but other than that, it's been pretty good, Roger said with a smile. Ah, oh, well that's too bad. But if you're looking for work, I own a lumberyard outside of town. I'd be happy to have the extra labor, the old man said. That'd be great, thank you, Roger said enthusiastically. You don't have any corporate social responsibility initiatives, do you? He asked. Are you kidding? The old man laughed. Come on over tomorrow morning and I'll show you the ropes. By the way, my name is Dale, said the old man. And I'm Roger. Pleased to meet you, he replied. Roger took a bus to the outskirts of town on Tuesday morning and then took a taxi the rest of the way to the lumberyard. His first day of work there was exhausting, but once it was over, he found having spent the day doing manual labor both physically and mentally fulfilling. There was another white shirt who worked at the yard who lived near him. He offered to give Roger a ride back to the city and a ride to the yard the following morning. That week, Roger visited Richards twice, and he went to the bowling alley at Mark's on Thursday evening. That weekend, one of the white shirts hosted a barbecue and a pool party at his house outside the city. Both Roger and Mike attended. There, they met a guy who owned a pinball arcade, which they planned to visit the following week. On Monday, after returning home from the lumber yard, Roger went to Richards in the evening. There was a good crowd for a Monday night, about 50 people. Roger finally got the nerve to go up and speak to Kate, a cute girl who he had had his eye on the previous week. After speaking for about 45 minutes, he was able to get her number. Roger suggested that the two of them go to Mark's bowling alley sometime, as it was owned by a fellow white shirt too. Kate seemed to like the idea, as she was quite into sports. The two of them were getting on quite well when Kate glanced at the door and let out a big gasp. Roger turned around to see Mike entering the bar, wobbling as he held his temple with blood flowing down the side of his face. What happened? Roger asked as the entire bar stared at Mike. 
There were three of them. I was on my way here and they just came up and attacked me out of nowhere, Mike said in visible pain. Who? Who did this? asked Roger. I don't know who they were. There were three people wearing red t-shirts. They approached me and knocked me down. As I got up, one of them punched me in the head and then they ran off, Mike explained. After one of the white shirts at the bar, who was a doctor, helped Mike, he went to the police station to report the crime. They took his statement, but they seemed mostly uninterested in doing anything about it. Upon arriving home, Roger checked his GNN news app on his smart device to find the first news story at the top of the page titled, New Extremist Group on the Rise. He clicked on it, which took him to a video. The video opened with a female news anchor sitting at a desk with a graphic of a man walking down the street wearing a white t-shirt beside her. Our city has seen the rise of a dangerous extremist organization. They have been called the White Shirts, and they are known to hold extremist views which experts have said pose a real threat to our democracy. But not all have taken this terror lying down. Some brave citizens have decided to fight back. The video then cut to a short, thin male reporter with thick framed glasses on the street with a microphone wearing a rainbow striped shirt. Roger's heart sunk as he saw that next to the anchor stood Madison wearing a red t-shirt. I'm here with Madison, the leader of a new anti-extremist organization who have stepped up to take on this new rising extremist threat. Madison, what is your organization and what are its goals? He asked. We are known as Anti-White Shirt Action, or Anti-Wish for short. Essentially, what our organization stands for is equality and liberation. We are a collective of citizens committed to upholding these principles by any means necessary. The biggest threat we see to our values is this new rising extremist group and we're committed to putting an end to it, she answered. Some have criticized your organization, calling it violent. How would you respond? The male reporter asked, looking up at Madison, whom he was a little shorter than. Madison, looking straight into the camera as if she was staring Roger himself in the eyes, said, You cannot make peace with bigotry and hate. The only way to ensure that justice prevails is to extinguish hate before it ever has a chance to rise. Those who tolerate extremism enable it. We don't wish to make peace with hate, but to eliminate it. Roger then shut off the video. He desperately hoped that Madison's new social crusade wouldn't take off, but he then checked his device again to see that the video had already reached 2 million views within only 3 hours of being uploaded, and realized that this could be a serious problem for both him and the white shirt community as a whole. On Tuesday, while going for a run in the park after returning from work, Roger saw a number of people wearing red t-shirts, though rainbow-colored shirts were still the majority. He did come across one young couple in the park wearing white shirts who he gave a smile and a nod to as he ran by. In their group chat, Roger heard that three white shirts had been fired from their jobs that morning, one of whom said his company was officially endorsing Anti-Wish as their new corporate social responsibility cause. Roger planned to go bowling with Kate on Wednesday evening. When they arrived at the bowling alley, they saw that it had been vandalized. Red paint had been splashed on the entrance and the windows. It happened last night. When I arrived here to open this morning, it was all over the building. I made a report with the police, but they didn't seem interested in doing anything, Mark, the owner of the bowling alley, told them. I'll come by with a few guys on the weekend and we'll help you clean it up, Roger assured Mark. In spite of the intimidation from the vandals, the bowling alley was full of white shirts that evening, at least 50 of them. Roger and Kate spoke with a group of six in the lane next to them. They too had had run-ins with trouble that week due to their choice of shirts. One girl said that her longtime best friend had disowned her. Another said that she had lost her job that afternoon. One of the guys said that he had been accosted by a group of red shirts, but he was able to escape unharmed. They all agreed that the number of people outside wearing red shirts had significantly increased in the past day. But despite all that, everyone in the alley appeared to be in a good mood overall. On Thursday evening, after arriving home from work, Roger decided to go to Richard's. As he closed the door to his flat and walked towards the stairwell, he jumped as he heard a massive shriek from behind him. WHITE SHIRT! Roger spun around to see the middle-aged cat lady with a face as red as the t-shirt she was wearing glaring at him with rage in her eyes. He quickly ran down the stairs with her screams echoing throughout the entire building. That evening there were upwards of 60 white shirts at Richard's. The talk of the bar was on what to do about the increasing danger which their community now faced. A number of people at the bar reported having lost jobs or friends in the past few days. One strategy that was suggested was to wear red shirts in public, 
possibly with a secret indication that one is in fact a white shirt, and to only wear white shirts openly in safe environments. Roger didn't want to do that himself, but he didn't have any problems with others doing so. He told Mike about the encounter with the cat lady in his building. Mike offered Roger to crash at his apartment if he needed somewhere to stay. Mike had also lost his job that day. In return, Roger offered to bring Mike along to Dale's Lumberyard on Friday to see if he could get him a job there as well. Roger didn't return home until 1am, hoping that that awful woman would be asleep and not notice him come in. He crept up the stairs to his door to find that the words, We know who you are, had been written on it in red paint. Feeling unsafe, Roger messaged Mike and told him that he'd take him up on his offer to stay at his place. The two would go to the lumberyard the next day together. On Friday, Dale offered Mike a job. The day at work went fine, but the guys at the yard were disturbed by the messages in the group chat of half a dozen white shirts reporting being accosted that afternoon one of whom was injured rather seriously. Though he didn't spend much time in the city on Friday, everyone Roger saw walking the streets as they drove by was now wearing a red t-shirt. On Saturday morning, Roger, Mike, and four other guys went to Mark's bowling alley to clean the red paint off the building. Mark thanked them for their help, but told them that the previous day he had received additional threats. One in the form of an intimidating letter left at the door of his business, and another from a group of red shirts who followed him and his wife for several blocks on their way home. After finishing the cleanup, the guys bowled in the afternoon and planned to go to Richard's afterwards, where Roger had invited Kate to meet him that evening. As the guys drove to Richard's, they heard sirens in the distance becoming louder and louder the nearer they got. When they turned onto the street, they saw smoke rising from Richard's and two fire trucks parked outside. There was a crowd of around 30 white shirts standing outside the bar. Several red shirts stood and watched from a greater distance down the street. They pulled up and got out of the car. Roger found Kate in the small crowd. What happened? he asked. Someone threw a Molotov cocktail through the window, she answered. Is Richard all right? Roger asked, looking around for him. Yes, thankfully. He's right over there next to the fire truck, said Kate. Roger went over to Richard. It's all over. I'll never be able to recoup these losses, Richard said. Richard, do you know who did this? Roger asked. They were wearing red shirts, but that doesn't really narrow it down, does it? He answered. It took the fire trucks forever to get here. Had they arrived sooner, the place could have been salvaged. It's almost like they wanted it to burn down. By that point, a large number of red shirts had gathered around the 30 or so white shirts. The white shirts could sense the hostility of the growing number of red shirts surrounding them. The only thing stopping them from attacking was the white shirts being in a big group together. We need to get out of here, Roger said to Kate. He saw Dale in the crowd. Dale, it's not safe for any of us here. Can we meet at your warehouse? We can discuss what to do next there. Sure, said Dale. Start sending out the message to all the white shirts to come to my place. We'll be safe there. The white shirts left in a group until they were far enough away from the malevolent red shirts. They began arranging methods of transportation to Dale's lumber yard and sending out the message to all other white shirts to meet them there. Someone with a car offered to take Roger and Kate to the yard. He had to pick up his wife and young son first, but they would have enough room in their car to fit the two of them as well. An hour and a half later, they arrived at the lumber yard where 100 white shirts had already gathered. They all waited another hour and a half for others to arrive. Most of the people Roger spoke to reported experiencing some kind of antagonism in the past few days, be it from their places of employment, their friends and families, or just random people on the street. After an hour and a half of waiting, now around 400 people, all of whom wearing white shirts, were now gathered at Dale's lumber yard. Roger had no idea that there were this many white shirts. After the sizable crowd had amassed and they were satisfied that everyone who was going to show up was there, they began to deliberate. The speaker would stand on a pile of lumber about two meters off the ground and address the crowd. There were a number of suggestions from speakers on what was to be done. Some reluctantly suggested that they disband their group. Not because they didn't love being part of the community, but because it was too much of a danger. While no one wanted to disband, many agreed with this sentiment, feeling like they had no other choice. Roger then stood up on the lumber pile. I don't know about you, but I'm not going back to living like that. Despite the animosity I've faced from our detractors, I've never felt more fulfilled filled and at home than I have with all of you. We've got a good group of resourceful folks here. I say we stay together and go at it on our own, he said. This gave many of those who were ready to give in second thoughts. Richard then stood up. I've lost everything I ever had. Now I only have all of you. I'm staying with the group. 
I don't have anywhere else to go, he said from the pile of lumber. Count me in. There's nothing for me back there. Everything left for me is right here, added Mike. The next few speakers who stood up also showed enthusiasm for the idea of staying together and going off and building something new as a community. After some time, the tone of the speakers became noticeably more optimistic, with each person saying how they could be of assistance if they were to leave their old lives behind and start over with the white shirts. After an hour or so of deliberating, they came to a consensus. The white shirts would leave. They would quit the city where they were hated and start a new community of their own, where they could be amongst each other and not have to live under a constant state of fear and hysteria. And so it was that the white shirts went off together into the unknown. They left behind jobs, properties, acquaintances, and sadly, some even left behind family members. But the white shirts did not despair, because despite all they had lost, they had gained something much more valuable, each other. And though they were leaving behind everything they had known in their lives prior to that point, Together, they finally felt at home. End of The White Shirts, written by Endeavor, illustrated by Gifts Ungiven.